All right, hi everybody. Once again, we wanna thank you all for participating in Secret Science Club Online. Um, Secret Science Club's home base is in New York City, and we know we have a lot of New Yorkers here with us tonight, but we're also pleased to have people tuning in from around the world, from California, India, Brazil, Australia, and beyond. Thanks again to the Dana Foundation for working with us to present this special and very international brain lecture featuring Dr. Daphne Shahami. Daphne Shahami is a neuroscientist, professor of psychology at Columbia University, director of the Learning Lab at Columbia University, and a member of the Dana Alliance for Brain Initiatives. She uses behavioral research and neuroimaging studies to explore the neural processes by which memory, learning, and decision-making interact. She is the recipient of the McKnight Foundation Memory and Cognitive Disorders Award, the Cognitive Neuro Society's Young Investigator Award, and the Association for Psychological Science Janet Spence Award. Plus, her research has been featured in Psychology Today, Vulture, The Verge, Time, and Popular, Popular Science, and she served as a scientific advisor to the Oscar-winning animated film, Inside Out. We're so glad she can join us. Please welcome Daphna Shahami. Really excited to be here. Um, uh, I guess uh, by looking at the number of participants, this is a pretty uh, big uh, secret. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, it's really great to see so many people show up this evening and I'm really grateful to the Dana Foundation um, and to the Secret Science Club. I think it's a, just a, such a wonderful idea um, you know, I think for me, getting to spend so much of my own time in my life thinking about science and working about science, uh, having kind of a, a, the occasional opportunity to share that enthusiasm and kind of the inside view of science with a broader audience uh, out there in the world is really um, a special and, re and important treat. Um, and, and I just feel like now we, more than ever, um, that's the case. And uh, it just feels... Um, that we need science now um, for its uh, objectivity and uh, uh, integrity and, um, and sense of uh, wonder and excitement and possibility for change. And so I know that in my own life, um, especially in these very strange times wherein science is a source of uh, both comfort and inspiration. And so I'm, uh, I'm really excited to be here today to share with you some of the work in my lab. Um, uh, as Margaret mentioned, I have a lab uh, at Columbia, uh, at the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute and the Department of Psychology. And I think uh, some folks from uh, the lab are uh, here as well. Uh, and um, if these specific questions come up, um, they, they can even um, uh, weigh in. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen now and we can uh, get started. Let me just go to my talk here um, and then share my screen. All right. Um, can you guys see that? Can you? My screen being shared. Everything's good. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna go with yes. 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 Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Dorian. All right. So, um, you know, I think for me the fascination with memory really started uh, very early on. Uh, growing up, I moved around the world a lot with my family, and um, I think it just became. Um, through kind of the, the, the exploration of the world and, and moving around so much, I think it became clear to me um, at an early age that we don't have to be the way we are. In other words, the specific experiences we have really shape uh, our identity. Um, and, you know, I, I used to read a lot of fiction growing up, and it was an idea that I felt was really well treated in fiction. And um, at some point, relatively late in life, I kind of stumbled on the realization or the recognition through uh, talks that I heard that all of that, all of these personal individual experiences that make us who we are, that really define us, um, that feel so unique and special, special to us, they somehow are accumulated um, over a lifetime and they're accumulating in um, cells. We have brains and the brains are all we have for storing those memories and this idea that everything we are from our first word to our interactions with our parents to uh, the difference between living in Tel Aviv or Minnesota, all of that was somehow embedded in some biological structure uh, that was essentially made of uh, flesh. And um, 
it, that, that, that observation just really kind of uh, struck me in a moment and, and led me down the path I am today to try to understand how that happens. What is it um, that enables our experiences to be embedded in memories, in biological uh, tissue? Um, and what, what does that mean? What is that understanding, how that works? What is that going to tell us both about the biology? But I think increasingly, as, as years go by, I feel like, what is it telling us about those memories to begin with, uh, why we have them, um, and what does it mean that we are who we are if we understand all of this um, kind of uh, subjective experience through the lens of neurobiology. Um, and so um, I want to start, um, oops, except my screen isn't working, there we go. Um, I want to start with a kind of a question that many of us uh, encounter in conversation, um, you know, the sort of probably endless uh, psychoanalytic Freudian jokes. So if you, someone shows you something and says, what does this remind you of, right? And I think we have this idea that sharing our memories really reveals something uh, personal and fundamental about who we are. So I know this isn't uh, the in-person kind of uh, a presentation uh, I had initially hoped for, but and you can't really answer, but I'm going to show you an image and I want you to think about what it uh, reminds you of. Um, and as you're thinking, you know, kind of what's the first thing that comes to your mind, these are, uh, these are cookies, of course, these are uh, Madeleines. Um, and uh, for me, what they remind me of actually more than anything is graduate school. And the reason is that when I started my PhD in graduate school, uh, and uh, kind of made this decision, or really didn't feel like a decision so much, I felt almost destined to study memory, I would search around um, campus and the universities uh, around where I was, looking for talks about memory at every level, from kind of molecules to circuits to behavior to fiction. Um, and at the time, it was really striking that, you know, it felt like half of these talks in graduate school started with the story of, uh, of Madeleine's, of Proust's Mad Madeleine's. And I thought this was at some point really uh, kind of amusing even because people would talk about um, uh, the Proustian Madeleine and then talk about molecular mechanisms. Um, so of course, in, um, some of you know and some of you may not, but the, these Madeleine's are mentioned um, in a, a famous book by Marcel Proust in Remembrance of Things Past. Um, and in this book, uh, Proust describes the taste of a uh, crumb of a madeleine as it's picked up from a cup of tea. And sort of that sensory experience, this sensation in his mouth, in the story, in this, in this uh, you know, very long novel, uh, elicits memories that bring back his entire childhood in rich, detailed memories and really allow um, uh, the uh, protagonist to kind of travel back in time to another era, to another place, to another sense of emotions and the richness of this person's life. So why would this example, why would this cookie appear in so many neuroscience talks? And I think really it was because it's such a beautiful literary example of something very magical about memory that we sometimes take for granted. And it's this experience we have where sometimes the smallest input, a sound, a smell, uh, uh, something we see, something really fleeting and, and seemingly arbitrary can evoke a full, rich world of experiences with details and emotions that um, have to do with a person's sense of self uh, and how they became who they are. And I think in, in, in many ways, this really is the magic of memory. It's certainly kind of the most uh, romantic side of memory. In many ways, it's really kind of the aspect of memory that got me interested in memory to begin with. Um, and I think that, you know, for uh, neuroscientists, the question then, of course, is where are all those details? If, so, if, if, if I'm here in my kitchen and there's a sound that can remind me of my childhood, what does that mean? Where are these details about my childhood kitchen? Um, where was this rich world in Proust's protagonist's uh, 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 brain? And how is it that something external can elicit a whole rich internal world in a way that makes it feel as if it's being re-experienced? So how do we have this kind of rich internal world at our fingertips? Sometimes we can't access it at will, and yet something come, some bit of information can evoke it. Um, and how are these worlds created in neurons and in synapses to begin with, how do they last for so long? 
um, how are they stored over a lifetime and, and how are they triggered? What, what does that triggering process look like? Um, the answers to these questions, I, th I think, are really some of the most beautiful and exciting examples of discoveries in neuroscience over the years. Um, and we've learned an enormous amount uh, about this even since my early days as graduate school. And I'm not going to go into all of that today. I'm just going to briefly mention that we've learned, for example, that, that the hippocampus is a structure that I'll talk about a little bit more later is essential for uh, both the uh, creation of these sort of rich memories, but also for um, this vivid re-experiencing of the past. Um, we know uh, something uh, quite a bit by now about uh, the synaptic mechanisms, um, uh, molecular mechanisms that allow for long-term changes in how neurons communicate. And we know that that's fundamental to these sort of long-term changes um, that happen when we're learning something new, when we're having a new experience and that dictate the uh, likelihood um, and the manner in which these experiences can last uh, over time. Um, we know from studies of sort of spatial memory even a great deal about how space is encoded in the hippocampus and actually some of those discoveries were uh, recognized uh, with the Nobel Prize uh, several years ago and so there's a lot we know about um, how spatial information which tends to be very rich and detailed is embedded in neurons and in the activity of specific neurons within the hippocampus. Um, and finally, we, we, we also now know quite a bit coming out of work from the last uh, 15 to 20 years um, about how this happens in the human brain. So this, is a, this, this image here is of um, uh, fMRI, a brain imaging uh, technique I'll tell you a little bit more about, um, that has shown us that everything we've learned from animal models of memory tends to be pretty much true in humans. So there's been an enormous amount of progress in understanding kind of the basic mechanisms of memory. Um, but, um, but that's really not what I'm going to talk about today, um, more than I just did for the most part. I want to talk about uh, another question that I think all these uh, impressive memory mechanisms really evoke, which is the question of why. It's very clear that the uh, um, computations, uh, biological mechanisms, metabolic mechanisms that allow us to form memories are extremely sophisticated and, and in a sense, very... Um, um, expensive, they're, they're, they're effortful. It takes a lot of energy from the brain, um, um, probably more than any other process we know of. And so these are very, very complicated processes. And, and to some extent, I think the question really comes up, why do we have that to begin with, right? So um, I lived in Minnesota when I was six. I have very vivid memories. I left Minnesota and those memories are maybe not so relevant, although they're being evoked a lot um, in recent weeks. Um, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and to tell you a little bit more about what I mean and what I think the answer is to the question of why, uh, I want to share with you a lesser known fact about Proust's Madeleine, uh, which is that uh, it apparently was not uh, Madeleine at all. Uh, I don't know if some, some of you may know this and I haven't dug into the original research, but apparently there are claims that uh, Madeleine doesn't create crumbs, uh, not the current recipes nor old recipes. And there's actually some evidence that in early drafts of his book, um, Proust's original experience was actually with toast. Um, and I think that raises you know, some really interesting questions. Um, uh, mostly, why did Proust edit his own memory when he decided to share this to the extent that it was autobiographical? Um, and you know, I think, if I pose to any one of you the question of why would Proust decide to um, change over drafts from a piece of toast to a mundane piece of toast to a madeleine, uh, we, you know, we won't know the answer for sure, but I think we would all assume that it was really just to tell a story that is more colorful and more romantic. Um, and I'd say probably to tell a story of that, that is more memorable. Um, and that for the sake of the story and its future impact on the reader and the ability to lure the reader into something engaging, uh, essentially Proust here may have decided to trade accuracy about the past for flexibility and memorability in the future. Uh, and what I wanna tell you about today is that I think our brain's memory systems basically employ a similar strategy uh, and that they do it for a similar reason. Um, that selectively remembering and editing uh, is exactly how our brain mechanisms for memory work, um, and that that essentially entails a trading off of accuracy for flexibility, 
uh, so that really what our memories can do is not necessarily recapture perfectly a moment the way it happened, but instead um, so that those events from the past can be well suited to flexibly guide our behavior in a future that is actually constantly changing. Um, so the, the main points I want to uh, kind of uh, get across with you today with some examples of, of work in our lab um, are first that our brain has specialized circuitry um, for creating rich, vivid, long-term records of the past. Um, but that memory is not only a record of the past, it's also the bedrock of our ability to imagine the future. Uh, and in that sense, it's really a creative, temporally transcendent device that helps us generate rich, vivid predictions of possible futures, just in the same way that we experience it, uh, generating those rich, vivid records of the past. And that these predictions are essential for making decisions, and that's gonna be true, especially when things are uncertain as they are <laughs> in, in, uh, uh, in spades right now. Um, so the way we study this, uh, very briefly to give you a sense, in the lab, sort of a team of people, uh, postdocs and graduate students and undergraduates uh, working in the lab at different levels. Um, and one of the main things we do is we develop these kind of computer games, we develop behavioral tasks. And what we try to do is develop tasks that allow us to capture um, um, memories in the making and decisions as they're being made. And we have to design the tasks very, very carefully because we need a good level of precision because what we try to do is develop these games or tasks in a way that allows us to uh, interpret specific cognitive processes as they're unfolding in, in real time um, and then to tie them to brain activity as we're measuring it with functional magnetic resonance imaging. So um, we, uh, I'll show you a little bit more about that in a moment. We use this uh, technology to image uh, mostly the healthy brain and look at which parts of the brain are active under specific cognitive conditions. What part of, which parts of the brain are active when you're creating a memory? Which parts of the brain are active when you're making a decision and what kind? Um, and in my lab, we also uh, do a lot of studies of patients with uh, damage to the brain. We do this um, uh, kind of with two angles. One is we try uh, to understand the specific role of parts of the brain, and we can turn to uh, humans um, who have damage to particular parts of the brain and ask, can we really um, pinpoint uh, what kind of cognitive impact that brain damage has, and that can, can that help us understand the causal or necessary role of a part of the brain for whatever cognitive function we're measuring. Um, and we also do it to try to understand better um, uh, various forms of pathology and memory and decision making, which um, are, are actually quite um, uh, common in all kinds of psychiatric disorders, such as eating disorders, schizophrenia, depression, and, and anxiety. And the hope is that if we can use our approach to cognition to better understand these deficits, that we will also be able to develop uh, new approaches to helping people who suffer from them. So I just want to give you sort of a, a brief background. I'm sure that in this audience, uh, many of you know some of this, um, uh, but presumably some of you don't. So just a quick primer on what we know about how the brain builds memories to begin with. Um, and really most of what we know about human memory in the brain goes back to uh, extraordinary groundbreaking work by Brenda Milner and Sue Porkin, um, um, who, uh, made these groundbreaking discoveries in, in the uh, 50s and onward. Um, and really what, uh, what they encountered was a serendipitous discovery that changed really everything we know about the mind and brain. Um, and that had to do with patient HM, who's probably the single most famous patient in uh, brain research. And uh, patient uh, HM, um, who was known uh, with his, by his initials for many, many years uh, while he was alive to keep his privacy, um, uh, but his name is Henry Mollison, had a very, very severe epilepsy due to a childhood uh, bike accident. Um, it was not treated with um, uh, medication. And so to save his life, he underwent brain surgery when he was 27 um, at the hands of a neurosurgeon, uh, Scoville. And um, Scoville uh, basically went and um, uh, localized the uh, source of the seizures and found that the seizures uh, were, uh, the, the source of the seizures was localized to the medial temporal lobe that would be um, uh, essentially part of the brain right here behind the ear, and specifically to the hippocampus, the structure that we've become all uh, kind of obsessed with. 
Um, and so what Scoville did is he said, oh, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save your life by going in and surgically removing the tissue that is causing all the problem, that is causing all this epileptic activity. And so here's an image that was taken years later because at the time, this is in the 50s, and at the time there was no ability to image the, uh, the brain of somebody who was still alive. And so in fact, when Scoville went in and did the surgery, um, he came out of the surgery and immediately reported from memory where the tissue was and later um, imaging showed where the tissue actually was. So this is uh, HM's brain. This is uh, the eyes, front of the head, back of the head. And here is where the hippocampus and surrounding regions would be. Um, you can see that in these uh, two images more clearly. So the most, the clearest here, I think uh, you can see here in black is where the hippocampus should be and where HM had no tissue. And so you see these sort of gaping holes from the surgery. Um, and the, uh, you know, people I think in many ways are still discussing whether this surgery was a success or not, and I think it really depends on how you define it. It uh, was an enormous help for the epilepsy, it cured him of the epilepsy, um, but it also led to a devastating memory deficit that no one had anticipated. And so although he recovered well and he was healthy and he was young, he remembered who he was, his language capacity was fine, but the doctors started to notice this strange pattern where they'd come in um, time after time and day after day. And it seemed as if even though his older memories of who he was were intact, that he was not able to create any new memories um, of experiences he was having after the surgery. And that's when they brought in Brenda Milner, who began a careful characterization of the neuropsychological profile that he was exhibiting. And what they found after much testing was that the kinds of memories he was no longer able to create were memories of people. You would meet someone over and over again, you wouldn't remember having met them, of, of uh, scenes, of places, and of moments, like what he had for breakfast. They also found, rather strikingly, that there were other forms of learning and memory that were absolutely untouched and were intact, uh, despite the brain damage. Um, and in particular, um, that uh, this is an example of a kind of skill that uh, HM was able to learn. So um, some of you may have had the opportunity to do this sort of frustrating um, game or task, and we, we often have them or see them at science fairs. Your job here is to trace the star with a pencil, but you have to do it while viewing your hand in the mirror, not in real life. And so every time you look at your hand, you want to move it right and moves to the left, and so there's a confusion, and it's very, very difficult to do it. But when you do it over and over again, you get better. And what they discovered is that HM also got better. So he was able to learn this skill of tracing the star just as well as somebody without brain damage. But remarkably, if they came in and tested him five days in a row, each day he said, I've never done this. I don't know what this is. What are we doing here? He didn't have any kind of explicit um, memory that he had done it, but his brain nonetheless was getting better at doing it. And so based on this kind of pattern of uh, impairments uh, uh, on, on these kinds of memories uh, while being spared on these kinds of memories, um, the uh, term that was uh, developed to describe what the hippocampus does um, was declarative memory or episodic memory, um, and the term for his condition was referred to as anterograde amnesia. Um, and the two main lessons in kind of summarizing decades of work were really the different kinds of memory are localized in different brain areas, um, and that the hippocampus plays a really unique role in forming a particular kind of memory, which are these rich episodic memories of moments in time, the kind of memories that we can share and access um, and describe in words. Um, and extensive work after that has dug into many, many details of how the hippocampus does it. What is it that's special about the hippocampus that helps us understand this ability to create memories in this way? And um, I want to share with you two very interesting facts about the hippocampus. First, I'm just sort of visualizing the hippocampus here. It's here in red in this kind of uh, com computerized rendering um, bilaterally. Uh, the hippocampus is called hippocampus. It's Latin for seahorse. Uh, and this image shows you why. Here's a seahorse. Here's what the hippocampus looks like when it's removed from the human brain. Um, and here's a, a slice of the hippocampus. Um, if you go into an animal and use a staining method, it would be called brain grow. And um, this is sort of just a slice through the hippocampus. And what this is showing you is this very unique, almost a kind of architectural structure that the hippocampus has, a dense organization of uh, cell bodies. Um, and um, 
a lot of work has really uh, begun to discover how, what it is about the unique structure of circuitry within the hippocampus that allows it to encode memories. Um, and there are kind of two really interesting anatomical hints looking not just at kind of the structure of neurons within the hippocampus, but also zooming out from the hippocampus and understanding a little bit about uh, what other parts of the brain it interacts with. So this is a very uh, complex um, figure. If I was in front of you in person, I'd be asking how many of you have seen this before or can even guess what this is. Um, but I'll share with you, th this is a, a description of visual circuitry by Feldman and Van Essen from 1991. Uh, visual circuit was one of the uh, first brain circuits to really uh, be uh, carefully uh, dissected um, across species. And their intention here was to show all these sub-regions of the brain that, uh, and of cortex that are important for visual processing. And that's the main goal of this figure. But what I want to point out is if you look at this figure carefully and go all the way to the top, which now Zoom is showing you something, there we go. If you go all the way to the top, right here, this HC, that's the hippocampus. So what this figure is telling us is that the hippocampus is in this unusual privileged position to be receiving an enormous amount of sensory input, in this case, visual input. And in that sense, it's really at the kind of top of the hierarchy. And many people like to use this figure to remind us that the hippocampus is not this sort of isolated memory machine, but really what it is, it's kind of the place where all the informational funnels into and that it really interfaces between sensation and perception and kind of higher cognition, thoughts and memories and internal representations. Um, and the um, second hint that emerged later from studies in humans as to what the hippocampus might be doing that also has to do with the anatomical connectivity uh, comes from studies that have looked at uh, kind of circuits for memory in the human brain. Um, so when human brain imaging emerged, um, this is still the technology we use. This, this is an, a picture of an MRI scanner. It's the same kind of technology that uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, that you would use to scan uh, your neck or your knee, but we use it to study the brain um, by taking advantage of something called functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, which basically measures metabolic activity or blood flow. Um, so when neurons are more active, there's increased blood flow uh, to those neurons that were more active. And so we can tell where there is activity in the brain at a pretty fine resolution because we can kind of track the change of blood flow over time. And that gives us a measure of which parts of the brain are active at relatively precise moments in time. Um, and so it's relatively fast and it's relatively localized and it's non-invasive. And that's why we see these sort of images of fMRI all over the place. And when people started using fMRI to try to look at what happens when people create memories, um, they would have a person, imagine you yourself are lying in the brain scanner here. You have these goggles on um, that allow you to view images. And people would show you, let's say, a series of 100 pictures and then take you out of the scanner and test your memory. And so then you end up uh, with these difficult tasks. You might remember half of those images. But by remembering half of those images, the researchers then can go back into the fMRI data and ask, was there anything different in terms of brain activity when you were creating memories that survived, that remained when you were watch looking at images that became a long-lasting memory versus when you were looking at otherwise similar images that did not result in a lasting memory. And people found, as expected, and across many, many studies, that one of the areas that shows greater activity when you're encoding a memory is the hippocampus, as expected. But what's really interesting about fMRI, one of the aspects is that it allows us to measure the entire brain. So people could then dis basically discover that the hippocampus, not surprisingly perhaps, doesn't really work alone. And that there are other parts of the brain in humans that are also active when you're successfully encoding memories. One of the most um, uh, prominent of those is the, are areas of the prefrontal cortex. I'm not going to go into those in um, too much detail today. But there was another somewhat surprising uh, finding, which is that another part of the brain that seemed to be active kind of in concert at the same times during memory encoding and some tasks as the hippocampus is this structure of the brain here, which is the stratum. So um, uh, just to orient you, this is on this hippocampus slide, is, this is the front of the brain and the back of the brain. Here's the axis, of the long axis of the hippocampus. Here's the stratum. This is now a, a kind of view as if it was a slice sort of down, down the middle, and the stratum is sort of uh, up here in the middle. And you can see this um, activity here in the stratum on both sides. 
And this was uh, surprising and interesting for all, all kinds of reasons. And one of them is that the striatum is a, the most uh, common target of the neurotransmitter dopamine. Um, I often refer to dopamine as sort of the celebrity of neurotransmitters. I'm guessing that um, many more of you uh, know about uh, dopamine than um, uh, about the other neurotransmitters. And dopamine is very well known because of its important role in addiction and generally even kind of reward related processes. We know that dopamine is fundamental to, um, uh, to, uh, to addiction, but also to all kinds of uh, positive experiences and, and, and learning from reward. So I just want to plant here this sort of a hint, this idea that this area that's a target of dopamine, which is related to reward and also action, showed, started showing in some studies this kind of connectivity with the hippocampus suggesting they were working together. Um, so suggested something about dopamine and rewards and the striatum is also very well known for its uh, role in, in action control and movement. And at first glance, you think that sort of memory and actions and reward may not be obviously related, but of course this observation and connectivity really raised the question of maybe these processes are more related than we realized. Um, and it spawned a very rich research field trying to understand both the nature of this connectivity between these regions, but also its implications uh, for how memory works and, and really for what memory is for. Um, so I would like to uh, transition here to talk about some of our studies that have tried to address these questions, um, and specifically, how are memories shaped by reward? Um, so um, just to give you kind of a, a, an anecdotal flavor for this, and it's not surprising to us, I think, as individuals that memories are shaped by reward. I think we all feel that we remember the things that are important more than things that are not important to us. Um, but it's really been a little bit of a mystery uh, for uh, why that is. And, and there's one particular mystery that we became very interested in. And um, um, I, don't, I don't know if any of you remember, but you know, once upon a time, we used to be able to travel. Um, and uh, I love to travel. And when I was uh, 20, um, I went to travel uh, in Paris. I spent the summer there. And I would uh, deliberately leave my map behind and just sort of go exploring various neighborhoods wherever my feet took me. Uh, in Paris, and as happens in Paris very frequently, um, I would encounter um, something interesting uh, or wonderful, like a, like a cafe. Um, and I think it's, you know, many of us have been through these moments and it happens, you know, almost on a daily basis. I think there's this, there's this interesting um, uh, phenomenon where I'm always surprised that I've managed somehow to find that same cafe again relatively easily the next day, even with, without writing down how I got there, without kind of uh, memorizing anything. Um, so it really kind of points, I think, to this uh, fundamental challenge for our brain in creating memories, which is how can we prioritize important information and memory if we don't always know in the moment what is important? Um, and that's just sort of one example, but I think if you think about it, you know, for memory to really be useful, we have to be able to remember things that were important with, when we didn't know it. It's often only with time that we discover the importance of things. Um, and so to get at this really interesting question, my former graduate student, uh, Kendall Brown, came up with uh, uh, a simple but very clever experiment. And she brought in participants to the lab and had them uh, navigate this maze. Um, people were controlling the maze and they were looking for uh, a treasure and they were told that if they found the treasure in this computer game, they, they would actually receive money for, um, uh, as a reward. And so here's just an example of one person's trajectory and to show that as they're navigating for the treasure, the treasure will appear as a gold coin. So this is now I'm controlling the navigation. And every time as I'm looking at when it's not the gold coin, I see a bunch of objects along the way. And then either I find the gold, the gold coin or I don't. And in this case, I do. So there's the gold coin. And uh, what Kendall had people do was she had them do these mazes over and over again, where she had half the mazes actually end in reward and half the mazes end without a reward. Um, and then she could test their memory for the objects that they saw along the way. And she could test their memory after 15 minutes or after 24 hours. And what she found when she tested their memory was something really interesting. Let me show you this, I'm gonna show you, on this side I'm gonna show you what happens after 15 minutes and on this side I'm gonna show you what happens after 24 hours. What she found is that when she looked at the memory after 15 minutes and then plotting her memory for the objects, this, this is the object at the end of the maze and this is the object at the beginning of the maze. So end of maze to beginning of the maze, she found slightly better memory for mazes that ended in reward and slightly better memory for things that were near the 
um, end of the maze, but no real uh, difference between them. But when she tested people's memory the next day after they had a night of sleep after 24 hours, she found this really interesting um, uh, pattern where in the mazes that ended in reward, there was like this boost for the memory for the objects that occurred right before the reward and much poorer memory for the objects that occurred earlier in the maze. And so it kind of uh, looked as if what was happening is that reward was having this retroactive enhancement on memory for sequences of events, but only after consolidation or sleep. So only after the brain had some time to process the information did we see this differentiation in memory for things that led to an interesting or positive or motivationally significant outcome versus those that did not. Um, so this suggests that memories are shaped by their relevance for the future. And um, I think that this prioritization of memories is often retroactive happening after an experience takes place. Um, this fits with a lot of animal work that shows that there's replay or reactivation of neural circuits during rest and during sleep. Um, and we think that this prioritization of memories really depends on this process that we refer to as consolidation. And it also depends on dopamine. Um, and that involves essentially a replay after the fact of memories that were significant. So all the while you're navigating Paris or Central Park or anywhere else, you have nothing that tells you that something important or rewarding is coming up. Once that thing happens, it tags something in the brain so that the brain can then go back and kind of replay what happened right before that rewarding event so that with time, that replay leads to this differentiation where memories that did not lead to any significant outcome kind of fade away, but memories that led to an important outcome become um, relatively enhanced. So this is really a mechanism that makes sure that memories are suited to guide later behavior. One of the um, uh, ideas here is that we think that th this is really kind of the, the hippocampus in, in employing mechanisms that help prioritize memories so that if you have to make a decision later about where to turn or where to go or what to choose, the, there's sort of easier access for memories that will help you make a better decision. So um, I wanna turn a little bit to focus more on the decision-making side of things and specifically the ways in which we think the hippocampus is working to kind of connect memories in a way that makes them more likely to lead you to uh, better decision-making. Um, I'm gonna show you kind of a, a schematic example of how we're thinking about this process. I'm gonna take kind of a toy example of thinking of uh, two events in your life that are somewhat related but different and separated in time. Um, and so just for the sake of illustration, let's take those events as Secret Science Club talks. Uh, so my colleague, um, uh, Nim Tottenham, spoke at the real Secret Science Club in person, I think about a year ago, um, also at the uh, Dana-sponsored um, uh, Brain Awareness Talk. Um, and uh, let's think of that as event one. So if you were there, uh, you imagine that that event consists of um, Nim and the room and whoever you were with and whatever else you brought with you and maybe the cocktail you were having. And let's think of event two as this event now. So different in many, many respects, but it has this common thread. It has a common um, uh, people who helped organize the two events. Uh, Nim and I are both from Colombia, so there are common elements between the two events, but they're otherwise separated a year apart. And I'm gonna walk you through a schematic of how we think that this, um, um, uh, that the brain really connects those events in a way that's useful for decision making. So I'm just gonna um, arbitrarily code um, uh, Nim's talk in yellow and uh, today's talk in peach. Um, and so the first thing I wanna point out is uh, uh, something we know about how the hippocampus encodes memory. So think of each of these squares as sort of an element. So Nim in the room and how you were feeling. And um, uh, let's say this is all the stuff related to Secret Science Club here in, uh, uh, coded as, as green. Um, and we know, in fact, from um, a lot of really beautiful work and, and, and important theoretical contributions by Neil Cohen and Howard Eichenbaum, who've written about this idea of relational encoding, this idea that what the hippocampus does when it snapshots and creates a memory is it's creating these links between all those different elements um, in, in a moment in time. So here's your memory, your schematic of memory from um, the talk uh, one year ago. And you get the same thing for your talk today. For the talk today, I'm imagining that this site did not um, yet uh, make myself a glass of the Memory Palace cocktail, but imagine um, you're having one in hand and imagine it's just really incredibly delicious. So here you are in this event having this delicious drink, also all the stuff associated with the Secret Science Club, um, and all of this encoded together in this relational encoding mechanism. 
what Cohen and Eichenbaum and others have shown is that this common element, because of how memories work and because of all these associations, in addition to being part of the current memory, because it, it can, has the capacity to evoke other memories, much like the Madeleine evoked this whole world in uh, Proust's novel. And that can lead to reactivation of a memory. And so now this common element will reactivate your memory of the event that happened last year. And so now you end up essentially in your brain, and this sounds a little um, uh, uh, abstract, but the idea is that here you are in the moment. This is, your, this, is, this is the moment you're in, but these mechanisms of reactivation mean that you're now eliciting at the same time, simultaneously, this memory of event number one. And what that means is that this is an opportunity for the hippocampus now to essentially experience these two events at the same time internally, and that can lead to co-encoding of these two events in a single memory. I refer to that here as integration. And the idea is that by reactivating this old memory, you're now creating new, essentially false links between events in the moment and events in the past. You're creating a mnemonic network that is correctly identifying this commonality, but that's giving you an opportunity to create these false memories or these links between this wonderful cocktail, let's say, and Nim's talk, even though this cocktail was not the cocktail you had when you were listening to Nim's talk. Um, so this is um, uh, all kind of a schematic, and we really wanted to dig in and ask, does the human brain uh, do this sort of thing? We had evidence, especially from animals, for each of these pieces separately, and we wanted to ask, does it, the brain actually work this way? And if so, will it help you develop a preference for NIM because of the cocktail you're having today? And so uh, to get at this, at this question, a former graduate student, uh, Elliot Wimmer, developed this uh, task to look at this. And I'm going to uh, give you kind of a flavor for what the task looks like. Um, in the task, basically, we try to recapture that schematic I gave you. And so we have people see, they're just looking at the screen, and they're seeing pairs of of um, images. So you see a face, this is Elliot's face, and then a random object, um, refer to this here as S1 and S2, and you see another pair, uh, this is my daughter Alma, and another object, these are not the, the real faces we used in the task. Um, but the important thing is that you're not receiving any reward for these, they're just happening kind of in the background, you can think of them as kind of like the background events happening in memory. But what we do then after we uh, expose people to series of pairs like this, is we take what we're calling these S2 images here, the circles, and we're pairing some of them with a monetary reward. So in a completely separate phase of this computer game now, you'll see some of these objects and receive a dollar, and people receive the dollar for real, the dollar for real. Um, and ob other objects um, uh, you see and you don't receive any reward for. So these are essentially non-rewarded and to some extent uh, disappointing. And what we wanted to know is that what kind of decisions people make later. So we would expect that if later we ask people to choose between this object and that object, we know people can do that, we know animals can do that, it's rather easy, and we'd expect people to always choose the rewarded object. What we're really curious to know is what people do when they encounter this new decision, new choice options that had never been paired before. You have to choose between this face and this face. And we control, you know, we sort of have different images, we know how much you like the images, so we, we can be certain that you're not choosing the images because you like one gender or because you like one age group or you happen to like one face. Um, so we, we know that that's not the issue. And what we want to ask is, even though we didn't give you any reward associated with any, any of these images, does the reward here for the uh, pink shape kind of leak over or spread over to your association with this face? And if so, we'd expect you to kind of have a preference for this face just based on association, not based on direct reward, just based on this integration. And for those of you here, um, either students or uh, just kind of uh, uh, science geeks, I think it's, it's fun to mention that this task we developed is essentially um, a human variant of a task that was developed in the 1930s for pigeons and rats. And, kind of the uh, prime time of uh, um, behaviorism and conditioning. And it's, it's a task that's referred to in the animal literature as sensory preconditioning. Um, and what we thought was happening, as I showed you in the schematic, it was the idea that when pe all people are experiencing here is the association between the red shape and the monetary reward, but we thought that they might be bringing back to mind um, this other associate, just like you might now may be bringing back to mind automatically Nim's talk if you were there. And that that would allow this kind of false memory or integration of this neutral image with monetary reward value. 
Um, and so we uh, developed this task and we scanned people while they were performing it and we saw that people develop a tendency to prefer those images even though they weren't rewarded and, and that when they do develop that tendency, uh, it's correlated with um, uh, activity in the hippocampus. Um, but really what we wanted to know is, is that because people are reactivating those, those memories, like the NIM memory, or, or in this case, the Elliott memory. Um, and so essentially to, to kind of prove that, we really would have to uh, read people's mind to get a deeper sense of what they're thinking about. Um, and although we can't read people's minds, we can take advantage of some uh, tricks and technology we have combined with knowledge that we have about how the brain works. And in this case, the knowledge we're taking advantage of is that specific areas in our visual cortex are active when we see particular um, uh, categories of images. And in this case, uh, there's a part of the brain, the fusiform face area, that's activated when you're looking at a face. If you're looking at my face now, your fusiform face area neurons are firing. But we also know that that part of the brain is active when you're even imagining a face. So we could take advantage of that here and we uh, could uh, go into each participant in our brain scanning experiment and find the part of their fusiform face area, their FFA that responded the most to faces. And we could look at brain activity for that person, plotted here on the y-axis, and compare it to the decisions they made on the x-axis. And what we found is that there was a correlation between those two measurements. So how much people kind of generalize the value from that pink shape to the person was correlated with how much evidence there was in terms of brain activity for reactivating the category that that image was paired with, in this case, a face. Um, and it's worth pointing out that we found that this is not something that people are doing strategically and they're doing it without conscious awareness. So it suggests that there's sort of these automatic mechanisms that are integrating our memories uh, over time. So the study suggests that memories uh, are integrated into a network of associations. It's something we're, many of us refer to as sort of a model of the world that we're constantly constructing and updating our internal model of what should be happening in the world. And that that's essentially what our memories um, are and how they're used is for the sort of dynamic updating of our model of the world and that the reason we need a model of the world is the same reason we need a model of anything really is to make predictions about what's going to happen next. Um, this integration depends on reactivation of associated memories and it allows value to spread across memories shaping decisions. Um, and you know, some of you might already be thinking, and it's a question I, I often get, so is this a good thing or a bad thing? Is this evidence for flexible memories because we're building these rich models? Or is this really an error of memory because now your brain thinks that NIM was associated with a cocktail that didn't even exist as far as I know at the time? Um, and it's a really kind of, um, I love this question, especially because it's sort of an opportunity to remind us that from the neuroscience perspective, there's really no good or bad. And so as opposed to economists who often talk about rational and irrational, I think from the neuroscience perspective, it's sort of, there's a mechanism and it has trade-offs. And really this goes back to the sort of trade-off of between um, uh, flexibility on one hand and accuracy on the other. Um, so in the last part of the talk, I just wanna briefly mention a whole other kind of chapter that, that kind of helps bolster this idea um, that the hippocampus really isn't there merely to create accurate memories of things that already happened, but that it's there to kind of bring us into a future that's changing and uncertain. Um, and that is that actually people found out that if you um, ask patients with hippocampal brain damage um, a different question, this goes back to, to, to work um, uh, many years ago by Tolving, you ask them just, um, what are you going to be doing next week? It turns out that patients with damage to the hippocampus and anterograde amnesia have a very hard time coming up with an answer to that question. They answer it, but they answer it in very abstract kinds of ways. And this led to um, uh, extensive research in the last decade asking whether the hippocampus is actually just as important for imagining the future as it is for thinking about and remembering the past. Um, so in a typical experiment, people might, um, uh, instead of asking you to giving you a memory test, I ask you to imagine you were lying on a white tropical beach in a beautiful tropical bay. Um, and it turns out that that kind of question elicits uh, hippocampal activity that overlaps with the kind of hippocampal activity we see when people are retrieving memories. Um, and this is a, a, a paper from uh, colleagues who looked at um, uh, the ability to report details of if, if you do imagine this, tell me what you're imagining. Um, and this is just sort of a, a record of the details that are being provided. And this is patients with hippocampal damage, a very small group here. Um, and this is healthy controls showing that 
all but one of these patients with hippocampal damage had a lot of trouble coming up with details that described what they were going to do. And this has really caused a change and a shift in how we think about what the hippocampus does. Um, that yes, it creates memories for the past, but it also is important for imagination of the future and sort of really a debate uh, how, how to um, think about the, the role of the hippocampus given all these uh, seemingly uh, disparate uh, jobs it's, it's fulfilling. Um, from our perspective, uh, just to briefly mention, this, this led to um, new ideas about how the hippocampus might be uh, impacting our ability to make decisions. And so in a beautiful um, series of experiments that former um, postdoc uh, Akram Bakur uh, did, um, we actually asked people to make seemingly very simple decisions. Uh, in this case, let's say between a Kit Kat and M&Ms. And we were deliberately going for decisions that you shouldn't have to um, work hard for. These are familiar objects to all of us. Um, but we added a little twist, which is that um, many of the decisions of the sort we asked people to make, Kit Kats and M&Ms, or potato chips and pretzels, or chocolate chip cookies and pound cake, um, we, we discovered in advance what people really prefer, and we gave them decisions that were kind of um, pitting uh, things they liked equally against each other. So for me in particular, these are pretty much my two favorite um, uh, candy bars, and so this is actually not a simple decision. It's a very difficult one. Um, and this is a, a um, the fact that people struggle with equal value decisions is something that's been very well known in economics and philosophy, often referred to in, in, in philosophy as burdens. Uh, paradox. It describes um, uh, this hypothetical situation what a donkey who's equally hungry and thirsty and e equal distance from food and drink might get stuck and die because they would never be able to resolve the indecision. Um, and although I don't think any one of us has ever died debating between a Kit Kat uh, and M&Ms, um, it is true that people and animals take much more time to resolve decisions between things that are of equal value than when they're deciding between things where there's a clear discrepancy in value. And one of the ideas that we've been exploring is that um, is that, that time, that extra time, is not because uh, people don't know what to do or animals don't know what to do. It's because in that indecision, the only thing that can really pull someone out of that indecision in an equal value situation is more evidence. You need more evidence to figure out which one you actually want, and that that evidence has to do with the ability to use memories to think about the future and that it depends on the hippocampus. Um, so in fact, um, in a series of uh, uh, papers, we've been exploring that possibility and I'm just gonna show you some of the brief findings where we discover that healthy people, when they're making these difficult decisions, show um, activity with fMRI in the hippocampus. Um, but perhaps even more interestingly, here I'm showing you data from uh, healthy people in blue and patients like HM with anterograde amnesia in red. Um, and on the x-axis here, I'm showing you how different the two items were in value across many decisions. The important thing to point out here is the zero point. This is the point of indecision. This is where people have to decide between two things they value equally. Oops. Um, and um, ah. and uh, on the y-axis here are uh, reaction times. So if you just look at the blue for a moment, what you discover um, is this very typical slowing down when people are uh, facing a decision between options that are of similar value. And the other um, uh, really interesting observation is that these amnesics with memory deficits were not known to have any striking deficits. They remember these items. We make sure of that. We use only items that they actually remember. And they're seeing two things. First, they are also showing to some extent this slowing down, but they're showing much less slowing down on the difficult decisions relative to the easy ones. But the really striking finding uh, to us was just how slow they are in general. Um, and we asked them to make similar decisions like figuring out how blue or yellow dots are or various things that have to do with perception. They're just as fast, and in fact, a little bit faster than healthy people. It's just on these preference-based decisions that they're slow. And we think this really um, uh, demonstrates that um, the hippocampus is important for deliberation, even among things where we don't feel that we're actively probing our memory to resolve them. Um, so I started out uh, with Proust, and I wanted to end with um, uh, another uh, exa literary example uh, that deals with memory from uh, uh, Lois Lowry in, in the book The Giver that I think really kind of, uh, to some extent, maybe answers this uh, mystery of why Proust switched the toast uh, for Mad Lens. Um, and the, the Giver is, is uh, typically thought of as sort of a young, young adult novel. It's taught at schools. I learned about it through my daughters and their 
um, uh, English teacher, and it describes a dystopian world in which basically no decisions really need to be made. Everything is predetermined. Um, people have jobs and families that are assigned to them, and weather doesn't change, and everything's sort of preordained, and there are all these habits um, that people don't really need to think about. There are no kind of active decisions to be made, and the story describes the, the interaction between um, this um, older member of society um, whose job he was destined to hold is that he keeps in mind, his mind, memories of the society before it became this dystopia. So memories of snow and war and love and blood, things that don't exist in this, uh, in this new society. And his, the book describes how he is assigned to uh, transfer his job to a younger uh, boy. Um, so the older person is the giver and the younger boy is the receiver who's receiving the memories. And it's a very complicated process fiction, science fiction, where the memories get transferred. And at some point in the story, the young boy asks him, why do we do this? This is no longer our society. Why do we bother going through this painful, difficult process of holding in mind, one of us, these memories from the past? Um, and the older uh, uh, fellow, the giver, says, well, I, we hold on to them. And every once in a while, um, the um, elders of our society turn to me and ask me to use these memories to give them advice. And the young boy asks, do you advise them often? And the giver responds, rarely, only when they are faced with something that they have not experienced before. I think this is really a kind of um, a special uh, insight into this idea that when we need memory the most is when things are most volatile, when there's most uncertainty. And then we, that when we need memories in those situations, it's not enough to just access the memory as it was, we have to be able to have memories that are flexible and, and adaptive and that are well suited for this purpose of guiding future behavior in a dynamic changing way. Um, so um, with that, I'll conclude. Um, we think um, extensive body of work shows that the hippocampus allows the formation of rich, vivid, long-term records of the past. Memory is not kind of arbitrary nor neutral. It's shaped by priorities, meaning, and intention, both in terms of intended actions and intended uh, decisions. And that prioritization is manifest in hippocampal mechanisms as they interact with other inputs um, and other interactions with other parts of the brain. Um, and in that sense, in building memories, our brain really trades off accuracy and flexibility so that we can use the past to adaptively guide behavior in the future. Uh, and this has all kinds of implications, I think, for real world decision making and economics, policy, education, as well as health, uh, addiction for sure, but also issues like eating disorders, uh, attention disorders. Um, and one of our goals is to really try to use this sort of basic understanding uh, to better under, to, to sort of better predict uh, ways in which we can help um, uh, work with memory deficits as they manifest in various situations. Um, so with that, I'll thank you for your time and for coming. It went a little longer than I expected. Um, I also want to thank uh, my lab. None of this is done uh, alone. I've been insanely lucky um, to have incredibly talented people to work with over the years. These are just the ones, um, some, some of the current members. And I want to thank the uh, funders of our work and the Dana Foundation for sponsoring this event. Thank you very much and happy to uh, stay around and take any questions. Thank you so much, Daphna. Uh, Daphna Shohemi, thank you for the wonderful talk. And we are going to do some questions. I'm just going to remind people how they can um, ask questions. They can go to the chat pane down at the bottom and they can look for me, Dorian Devins, and send it to me and I will funnel it to you therefore. Or they can go down to the uh, participants panel and raise their hand. So we're going to kind of mix up the ones that's, that uh, came to me and the ones that are going to be live. And I am going to start off with the first question for you. Who is Linda uh, says, questions have recently been raised about the validity of fMRI in psychological studies. How do you deal with this? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I'm always happy when that, when that comes up. Um, trying to, to not give a really long answer. Um, the short answer is most of the questions that have come up have not been about the validity, like whether it has any value or not. 
Um, the debates have been about the particular um, uh, parameters, mostly about software tools that we use um, and whether they're all the same or different and whether some of our analyses are biasing the results or not. Um, and uh, the, I think, I, to me, every time I see these issues come up, I think it's actually very encouraging. I think all science is constantly um, improving itself. Um, and uh, this is an important example of a field that I think has integrity and uh, self-examination and is not afraid to constantly, we're scientists, doubting things is sort of what got us in the field to begin with, combined with sort of, you know, I think we, we, all, we all tend to have this, many of us, this combination of sort of cynicism and skepticism with like enthusiasm and passion and, uh, and, and optimism. And I, I think those things play out in, in really important ways. I think it's very important to constantly be wondering exactly what we're measuring and, and uh, how it works. And so I think it's a sign of a field that's, uh, that, has, that has courage and uh, integrity. Uh, and it's also a sign of a field um, that's still young. Um, we have no idea where the field will be in 10, 20 years, but it's, it's evolving so rapidly um, that it's really important that we uh, kind of constantly be uh, exploring it from, from all directions. Um, so I, th I think actually, uh, you'll, we'll find that, and we're already finding, um, that the findings are valid and the tool is valid and we're just getting better and better at catching areas that need uh, refinement. Where we really need help, anyone there out there are from engineers. We need ideally stronger, better resolution and signals as, as we go through the next uh, several years. Great, um, now we're gonna take a live question from Fire. Fire, if you're there, I'm going to unmute you. Hi, um, I actually didn't quite have a question, but or you had brought up something about false memories and I was just kind of thinking about in the context, and I don't know if you were using it in the same sense of like with past abuse, alleged abuse and you know, kind of memories of false memories. So it just kind of came. Yes, kind of, good, good question. I have no real question related to that, but I don't know if it kind of pertains to some of what you're talking about. It's a, it's a, it's an important clarification. Thank you. Um, I was not uh, referring to uh, kind of this controversial uh, phenomenon of um, rediscovered memories. I was referring uh, to the more um, mundane phenomenon of uh, remember when we were at that restaurant and you said this, and the other person says I wasn't with you at that restaurant, and you are able to figure out that they really weren't with you, but for some reason. You saw them earlier that day and you had a confusion of memory and so the, the idea that sometimes we recombine events um, and essentially create a memory that can feel incredibly real even when we're encountered with the reality that it never happened. Um, how and whether those two phenomena are related I think is a, is a deeper more complicated question that um, we don't necessarily have a straightforward answer to. Uh, I'm going to throw in a couple more because we have a lot that came in to me. Um, Sandra says, in the same vein as the toast Madeline dif difference, if it were inadvertent, isn't that an indication of why eyewitness accounts and testimony and lineups are unreliable and dangerous? Um, there is a lot of evidence that uh, eye testimonies are not reliable. Um, there's classic work uh, by Elizabeth Loftus in the 80s. Uh, she has shown um, that merely changing the way people ask the questions in an interrogation, in her case, in experiments where people would just watch an event in a movie, that the questions basically make their way into the memory. Um, and in many ways, that, I think that that's directly related to what I'm talking about, this idea that because we're constantly constructing and re-encoding and reconstructing and re-encoding memories, it's a much more dynamic process than we think that the one side of that is that our memories are very vulnerable. They're vulnerable to insertions, to false connections. Eyewitness testimonies are vulnerable to misdirection by questions. And many of us for many years have been horrified by that again, because I think the subjective experience of the rememberer is with a lot of confidence. Um, the flip side of that is that th I think that you know it's like you sort of wonder it's like is this is this a might seem like a bug in these examples but that it's really a feature that it's really because it's that same flexibility and the reconstruction of memories that allows our memories to stay alive and active and be updated 
So it's, it's that same trade-off. It's a great example of it. Great, thank you. We're gonna hear a live question from Rainy Zhang. Rainy, if you're there. Hello? I, sure. Oh, no, I, I did the raise hand as a test for you earlier, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, but, no, but actually I could ask a clarification question about the, because me and friends are like texting each other, like discussing while we're listening. Could you clarify that the result of the maze experiment? Yes. Um, why the, the kind of, the results after 24 hours kind of like reversed for uh, reward and no reward, I remember? Yes, yes. Um, so the, the, the short answer is the result that I showed and which we've seen in, in a number of replications um, is that what you get after 24 hours um, is um, relatively better memory for the objects closest to the reward and that memory comes down the farther they are from the reward. What you're asking about is like, well, wait, it looked like in the non-rewarded you got the opposite of that. Um, and that we got in some studies, but not others. So we still don't fully understand that. And there are a lot of possible reasons that may happen. In general, I didn't talk explicitly about forgetting today, which is kind of its own related but interesting phenomenon. What we think might be happening there is sort of a complementary process where the brain is simultaneously uh, uh, kind of prioritizing memory for good things that happened at the end of the maze um, as time goes by, but also showing uh, the reverse for mazes that ended in no reward and that part of that might be that if you think about a significant event um, wanting a reward and not getting a reward is also a significant effect it's just sort of flipped in its um, valence and so that might be part of the reason why we get this um, the flip um, but i think the, the main thing we're, we're sort of confident about is that it takes 24 hours to get essentially the emergent the differentiation of the patterns between mazes that were rewarded and mazes that were not Okay, um, Lori has a question just about in one of your diagrams, the vision diagram just below the HC is ER and wants to know what that is. Yeah, that's EC, it's interrhinal cortex. It's a part of cortex um, that's right, uh, surrounds the hippocampus and it's the direct input into the hippocampus. Um, and if you go read about that um, Nobel Prize for um, Spatial Navigation from 2016, um, uh, it's because they discovered these spatial interesting spatial properties, both uh, in hippocampal neurons and then interrhinal cortical neurons. Okay. Um, I'm gonna take another one that came into me. I have a lot of questions here. Elias has a question. If a person were to lose memories of their past, such as from traumatic experiences, that, uh, such as of traumatic experiences that shaped who they were as a person, would their personality traits likely remain the same? Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting question. I really get to the heart of like, to what extent are our memories who we are and in what sense? Um, you know, th there are these interesting uh, case studies of people who undergo brain damage and then kind of a personality transformation. And that is typically happens when people have damage to um, uh, prefrontal cortex um, and not, it's not reported uh, with hippocampal damage. Um, uh, but then again, with hippocampal damage, you have to remember that people like HM do retain memories of who they were. Um, and so it, that, it's, there's, it's like there's not a really good example in memory research that allows us to totally tease those things apart because in reality, most cases of brain damage related memory loss have to do with um, uh, the inability to create mem new memories. Um, so it's, uh, it's an interesting question. And, you know, I'm thinking now of like some of the work on Alzheimer's where you know, many people do describe kind of changes, um, certainly emotional changes. It's just very hard to know what the cause is. I think you, your question implies a really interesting causal mechanism that I don't think anyone has really successfully been able to address. Okay, we're gonna take a live question next from Chris with a K. Uh, Chris, if you're there. So I guess my question um, isn't, technically on the, on the research that you've already mentioned, but kind of going back to your Alzheimer's example there, I guess, you know, I, I've heard about a lot of studies that focus on kind of improving your short-term short -term memory in terms of like, say, like remembering a lot of like digits, right, that were, you know, rattled off to you. I guess, is there any research that you know of that kind of helps with um, identifying specific techniques for improving, say, like your long-term memory, say, for like older people that are starting to kind of 
lose their lose their hippocampus function. Yeah, um, there were two things that come to mind immediately, um, and one of them has to do with this evening's cocktail, which is the memory palace. The memory palace is a memorization um, strategy that um, I'm told, and when I've tried it, is 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 very effective. Um, and you can read about it. And um, there's actually a book. Um, uh, that I really enjoyed uh, called Moonwalking with Einstein that describes um, the author's uh, experience sort of training for a memory marathon and training himself on all these various um, memory improvement techniques that um, have been known for very, you know, since uh, Greek philosophers uh, known, known to work to improve memory. Um, and in fact, if you think about this, the memory palace strategy basically takes arbitrary things to remember and puts them in a spatial context that's familiar. Um, and if you think about um, what I said about sort of spatial memories being rich and the role of the hippocampus in spatial representations, it's, it's an interesting connection between kind of these strategies um, and how they work and what we know now about how the hippocampus works. Um, the second part of the question about sort of people on the older side of the spectrum who are interested in knowing what might work and um, you know, most of the research so far suggests that one of the things that helps the most with resilience in patients with Alzheimer's and in healthy aging um, is actually um, um, activity, exercise, cardiovascular exercise, um, uh, for reasons we don't completely understand, but it seems to have a really uh, helpful effect on hippocampal physiology and, um, and structure and memory. Okay, we're gonna take a couple in a row here from people sent in, there are just many. Uh, Jeremy E says, uh, question, how is the process of memory making and retention, if at all, affected by ADHD? Yeah, great question. Um, the, the, so it depends on how you look at it. Uh, the really interesting thing uh, with um, attention, um, and especially with ADHD, right, is that it's not an obvious, it's not really about like bad attention. It's just sort of more distributed attention in a sense. Um, and certainly if you haven't processed something as input, you're less likely to remember it. Um, but it's not, it's, it, there's no kind of uh, uh, strong evidence that there's a memory deficit uh, that goes along with ADHD beyond difficulty in encoding certain things, um, nor the other way around. Um, and uh, you know, we've just, as an aside, we, we've recently gotten, we have this whole other side of the research in the lab that I didn't mention at all today that's about curiosity, what it means to be curious. And um, one of the things we're finding is that when people are curious about information, they're more likely to remember it. So that's, in a sense, another example of how we remember what's, what matters to us. Um, but we're also finding that at least in some ways, people um, who are more impulsive or have kind of a score higher on ADHD-like measures on some measures also display more curiosity together with more impulsivity. Um, and that would suggest that there might be something there that suggests perhaps in better memory just for different sorts of things. So this is all a kind of a speculative thing. I probably shouldn't be saying on a um, uh, talk that's being recorded because we don't really have the, um, the data uh, to you know, to, to slam dunk this uh, claim yet, but that's the kind of hypotheses, uh, those are the kind of hypotheses that we're uh, raising in, in the concept of ADHD and memory um, in the lab at the moment. Here's a question, um, this is a pretty relatable one from Neil. Um, why does it seem to be fairly common to be unable to remember the name of a person, a song, a book, when one is trying to refer to it during a conversation, but five or more minutes later, the name of the person, song, book, or whatever is recalled easily? That's so funny. Someone just asked me that this morning. We were on a group committee call and it happened to a colleague and he texted me and said, how does that happen? I'm like, why do we not know? Um, uh, we don't have a simple answer to that either, but, but there's a lot we do know about it. And uh, this also relates to aging. We know that often uh, we can do something called a directed search. I can ask you, what was the name of the cookie I started my talk with? And you are able to input my question and direct your search and come up with the answer. That ability to direct a memory search is related to um, the prefrontal cortex um, and its mechanisms in kind of controlling the hippocampus. So the ways in which the prefrontal cortex guides uh, the hippocampus as it kind of sorts through uh, information. Um, and that is something that uh, gets worse with age uh, from an early point. I can feel it. 
Um, and it, 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 it's something that, you know, as people age, they, they complain about a lot. Um, and that is a separate mechanism from these sort of associative mechanisms, like the story itself of the Madeleine in, in Proust's book, where it's this automatic activation of something. And so many people experience this directed search failing, and yet it must, the search itself probably kicks some automatic process that's not a directed search, which in of itself works just fine. And then the answer kind of bubbles up just by these background um, automatic search mechanisms. Okay, we're gonna take one from uh, Tina D. Hi, yes, thank you so much. And, um, uh, I'm sorry for you that it's not live, but for me, who is in, sitting in Los Angeles, I'm very happy to be here. So thank you. I'm I'm call, I was so interested because my mind is exploding right now. I'm a poet and I also teach poetry. I've taught poetry for 30 years as a freelance artist. And I'm fascinated, you know, I go back and forth with being fascinated with my process, not because it's me, but just the process of writing, um, and wonder is that first draft that comes through, because I work so much with memory and recreating moments, is that the reward? Is the poem the reward? And then is the decision, the editing I make, and then also a reward because it recreates. I'm also fascinated by, by watching my students from all ages, from second to third graders to 70 plus year olds, and talking about the important collaborative work of editing and creating more powerful work, which is maybe that whole thing with the Madeline versus the toast, right? So I'm very interested in that writing, draft, first draft to editing. What is happening there? Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in it too. Um, I think it's a really beautiful, mysterious process. And um, just to mention, we at the Zuckerman Institute um, now have a sort of artist in residence program. And this year we have the first writer in residence. Uh, and we have the author, Nicole Krauss, and she and I have been talking a lot about um, memory and writing and how it plays into this process. And I think it's very difficult um, to know, you know, I think I think one of the things interesting about reward is that it's um, it's subjective. When we do experiments for scientific uh, kind of control, we do things like give people money or chocolate. And uh, um, but I think you know your your question really raises the fact that for men, many of us, reward is not a concrete thing that happens in a moment. It's very subjective, um, it, and so it's it's broader than that. Um, so I feel like I couldn't possibly say whether um, what, what it is that it, that is rewarding in, in, in that process. I know from talking to um, Nicole Krauss and other writers, many people feel like they, it, it, they have no choice. It's just the story's coming out and they can't stop it to some extent. But I think people also, at the same time, you know, force themselves to sit and struggle through. And um, so I, 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 I'm finding it um, difficult to map that uh, specifically. Um, even when I'm thinking about sort of when I, when I, when I'm writing um, scientific papers, you know, what, what is the reward? Sometimes the reward is that, um, you know, that, that, that I'm about to meet a deadline or that I get to not have to do it anymore. Um, so I, I think, you know, this question, once we cross the threshold from a well-defined reward into many more interesting rewards, I think all kinds of interesting questions come up. One of them we're thinking about now in the lab it has to do with this, just generally reframing the example of the deadline is, is it rewarding to avoid a deadline or is that avoiding a punishment and are those the same thing, for example? So we're trying to understand uh, that a little better. But I, So I have more questions and answers back to you, but thank you. Okay, we have one from Kedar, Kedar who says, I found it interesting that after 24 hours, the non-reward memory recall reversed order, i.e. after 15 minutes, the end cards had better recall, but after 24 hours, the beginning card had better recall. Is there a reason for that? And does lack of reward have an opposite effect as a reward? Yeah, great question. This is similar to the question earlier. And you know, I, th I think um, it's a question that we're still uh, puzzling over mostly because that, that particular pattern is something we haven't completely replicated. So we're not sure how much of that is sort of noise in the system and versus something serious that we don't yet fully understand. So it's really still under investigation. Some of the ideas are that um, if we have to adjust memories 
as a function of their outcome, then uh, uh, an anticipated good outcome that didn't take place should also be um, meaningful and should also play a role in shaping our memories, but we just don't completely understand in that particular context how that's working out yet. Okay, TYL also has a comment more than a question. With regard to the study that showed memory consolidation in test subjects who were paid for their efforts, I remember from my intro psych class in college that kids paid to perform well in tasks lose mm -hmm. interest in the task. Yes, this, the, this uh, wonderful classic psychology um, finding that if uh, you give kids external reinforcement, they lose their intrinsic motivation. And it, it's, uh, it's something my colleagues and I joke about, who are, who are, my colleagues and I, who are all parents, joke about because it's something we, we all studied and we all understand and it doesn't stop us from trying to bribe our children to do what we want them to do or need them to do. Um, and uh, there was actually a really nice brain imaging study of that that came out. Um, I think the, the first author was Ku, I think it was Kumorayama, who looked at um, this kind of intrinsic versus extrinsic reward and their effects on the brain. Um, and much like that classic psychology study, um, they found um, that the changes in how motivating that this sort of shift from uh, intrinsic to extrinsic motivation, reducing motivation was uh, mirrored in a shift in brain activity in these regions of the stratum that received dopaminergic innervation uh, as well, suggesting that um, these regions of the brain are really about subjective motivation to act, uh, whether the motivation um, is uh, heightened or weakened by uh, internal and external forces. We're gonna take a live one here from Ben. Ben? Hi, hi. Um, I had a question you talked about um, with dopamine and people remembering positive memories. I was curious about negative memories and uh, also in related to like mental disorders, if people are remembering negative periods in their life, um, is, that, is that like almost a process of like a dysfunction in the hippocampus or the brain or is it a almost like a function of like, the brain is really good at memory, memorizing things. And it's just like very good at withholding memory. So, so um, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent, there's a lot of interesting things there. I'm not sure I hundred percent understood what the question is. It's sort of about memory for, for negative events or? Yeah, for negative events, yeah. 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 Um, so I'm much more interested in positive events because that's kind of in the focus of the lab um, and, um, sort of like a hopeless optimist uh, in general. But, um, but of course, there, there's a flip side to this. And, and it's a very interesting one in terms of brain function. And um, it's both the flip side and the same side in the sense that if you think about the broader picture of our brain um, creating memories that are important for the future more than the past, then things that are dangerous and alarming and life-threatening or emotionally threatening, we should remember them because they will be very important for our survival. And in fact, we know we are very good at remembering them. If you people who do studies in animals, uh, learning that a cue predicts a shock, animals learn it in, in one, one shot. Uh, people who had food poisoning sometimes never eat that food ever again, right? So we know we have mechanisms in the brain for very rapid, very robust learning and memory for negative events. Um, uh, many examples from trauma, um, PTSD is related to hippocampal mechanisms and even to hippocampal volume. So there's a, um, a whole kind of complementary story on the side of, um, of negative events. And uh, in many ways, the, the from the kind of research sociology perspective, a lot of that work was discovered before the positive side. I think people um, became, took it for granted much uh, earlier in our field that there's something special about negative memories um, that needs to be understood. And in many ways, kind of the, the newer development is realizing, oh, wait, there's this whole other parallel side of the story on, on, on the positive side of things. Um, but we're still figuring out a lot of how those two um, balance each other out. Okay, our, our next question was um, <clears throat> actually sent in to me from Brooke Mellon, but I see Brooke Mellon is also here live, so we're going to uh, take it live from Brooke. Yeah, I mean, I'm, a lot of people are asking kind of similar questions, but along the line of negative memories, have you done any work or know of anybody who's done work particularly about 
not forming memories as you go through a traumatic experience. I've heard sometimes the hippocampus can actually shut down a bit. So do you know anything about that? Yes, yes, there's a lot of work um, about uh, trauma, but also really about stress um, and memory. Um, uh, it's just an interesting finding people have shown sort of the stress receptors in the brain are incredibly high density in the hippocampus. So it's very clear that when we're stressed, um, the release of uh, corticosteroids, which are these stress hormones, has a very big impact on hippocampal function. Over time and repeated stress, it can have damaging effects on hippocampal neurons. Um, so uh, there's been uh, really elegant work on this by uh, Bruce McEwen and many other colleagues. Um, uh, Joe Ledoux at NYU has done a lot of work and has written really beautifully for uh, public audiences about uh, stress and anxiety uh, and memory in the brain, um, which all really relates to trauma. And so we, we know that the hippocampus, right? So think of HM, think of what the hippocampus is doing. This basic function of creating a record of a moment in time is just heavily impacted by high stress events that probably um, um, serves an adaptive function because there are certain moments of stress where you want to just really remember one thing, like a focusing in, here's the bad thing that happened now, I need to remember it, but that surely comes uh, at a cost for the general ability to encode uh, the broader context of what's happening um, in an extremely traumatic moment. Nicole asks, some meditative techniques use visualization. Do you know of any studies in, of meditation in patients with hippocampal injury? I don't know of any studies. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know of any studies that have done that. You know, I think really kind of the modern neuroscience investigation of meditation is still relatively young. Um, there have been some um, imaging studies um, um, there's a, quite a bit of work on meditation and what people refer to as the default mode networks or the circuits in the brain that are always um, active that can be uh, somewhat um, uh, reduced with meditation that would include the hippocampus. Um, it's an interesting question because as I mentioned, there's several studies showing that people um, uh, with hippocampal damage can't vividly imagined to the same extent. So it's very interesting to, to think about what would they do? Um, what, it, what would that mean for their ability to meditate and for the ability of meditation to um, help them? Good question. Jesse wants to know, um, I'm curious to know whether the gap between the association and reward tasks as manipulated in the Wimmer et al. study, in particular, given that sleep is thought to be important to consolidation, did some participants do the two tasks on the same day while others did them with sleep in between? And if so, what were the effects both behaviorally and in imaging? Um, so the first study with that maze, um, we had participants come in 15 minutes later or 24 hours later, so we could do that comparison. Um, in the Wimmer study, we didn't do that. It was all in the same day, so we haven't yet tested the effects of consolidation uh, on that. Um, and we need to do that. I think it's an important question. There have been some um, related studies in, in animals, but with a slightly different task. And so we, we just don't really know the answer to that yet. We just haven't done, done the project. All right, we're gonna go to Daniel B. Daniel. My question was, we talk about memories as like a coherent thing, but are there different, are there different names for the memory? Like when does a memory become a memory? From the instant I, burn myself with a hot match, is that a memory? Or is it the day after when I think about burning myself or having been burnt? And you talk about how the processing takes place where it sort of moves. Um, are there different names for those different types of memories? And when actually does a memory begin? It's an interesting question. In, you know, when we do the scientific studies, we stick to very strict definitions and there are in the field, many definitions for different kinds of memory. In fact, um, that was really one of the consequences of the discovery of HM was that there was sort of this, almost this explosion, this recognition that there's more than one memory and more than one different parts of the brain might be doing different kinds of memory led to this whole idea of a taxonomy of memory and there were like two different kinds of memory and then four and then eight and, um, uh, and 
in recent years, if anything, there's sort of been a little bit of a step back from that to say, wait a minute, are these really different memories? We can give them different names and we can talk about long-term memory and short-term memory, but are those really different things when we think about the basic brain mechanisms? Um, so I think both things are true, that not all memories are the same and we can dissociate between them. And at the same time, I think kind of for the sake of parsimony, um, it behooves us as scientists to really question to what extent those boundaries are um, boundaries that emerge because we can come up with tasks that differentiate things or are they really uh, boundaries between kind of natural categories in terms of how the brain works. Um, similarly, the, the definition of memory really has always been that it's a memory when it's, when time, when it's no longer alive, uh, right? Um, uh, on one hand, so if I can um, see my screen, that's perception. That's not memory, it's here live. Uh, and on the other hand, there's also, we know that both those two things are so tightly related. We see what we expect to see. We're constantly predicting what we might see. And all of those in the moment predictions depend on memory. My expectations about what my screen will have on it in the next split second is related to what's happened to me, you know, ever since I've been on Zoom, which is the last few months where, you know, my life has shifted onto Zoom. Um, so I think, I think the question is, is, is very insightful because it's really, I think, intuiting um, this idea that because memory is so constructive, it's also related to how we're experiencing the moments, that there's no clear, clear cut divide. Um, that said, um, you know, people like HM basically would be okay for a few seconds and then kind of fall apart. So as long as there was a live thread of something keeping them connected, it was okay. Um, if they had a conversation that they could carry for 15 minutes and then they would step away, they would come back and it just never went to the next kind of memory or never, never, never created a long-term record. Uh, Valerie P. asks, if memory can serve a predictive purpose, does that correlate with Lisa Barrett work on emotions as having a predictive function? Yes, I think it's, um, I think it's a good connection and a very valid one. This idea that I think has really become kind of um, prominent that, that, it's, that, that, that the, you know, if we had to say one, the one job our brain has is to predict what's going to happen. I think it's a very similar idea here that um, that that's what memory is contributing to, this ability to, to predict, because it really doesn't matter what happened before unless I can use it to predict what's going to happen next. And so I think it's a, at, at, the, at that broad level, a very similar idea to uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett's ideas about emotion. We have a live question from Hillel H. Hillel? Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I, was, I wanted to ask, much of this work, or maybe even all of this work, is, is um, about the mechanics of memory and how we process those, um, which is, by the way, tremendously interesting, so thank you for this whole talk. Um, but I was wondering if, if in all of this research, do you feel that this in any way will bring us closer to answering the more sort of philosophical questions about cause and effect? I mean, if we think of the brain as a memory processing machine, essentially, um, you know, are we actually making decisions to what, to what extent do we really control that and what does that mean? Um, do you think that we're, by sort of chipping away at these, at these mechanistic problems, are we getting closer to getting a really more in-depth understanding of those kind of, I hate to say it, but philosophical questions? Oh, don't hate to say it. I think philosophical questions are incredibly important. Well, I think I just meant that I think the philosophical and the scientific really aren't a different thing. Ultimately, there is an answer. Uh, yes, I, I, I think they're deeply connected. And, um, you know, in my opinion, it's incredibly important to ask those questions together. And um, uh, I see, you know, I think it's really all about all about what it means to be human and how our brain works is not just a biological question or just a psychological question. I think there really are philosophical implications. Uh, I spent a big chunk of my fall uh, as part of workshops trying to understand what is consciousness, kind of across disciplines, asking what does neuroscience, what does neuroscience and psychology have to offer philosophy and vice versa. And I think 
right now there, there are gaps between the fields for sure but i think you know at least at columbia and i think in general many places around um the world that there are really important conversations to be had there and i think honestly i think you know one, one thing in common is we're, we're trying to understand really incredibly difficult things and, co and they're complicated and i think we'd have to be um you know we'd have to know much more or be much more arrogant to think that any one discipline won't be helpful um, for this incredibly you know complicated challenge we're all facing to understand the mind so i, I think i think the connection to philosophy is is fundamental and um maybe not any one not every one particular um neuroscientific empirical study that we have might not all touch on the questions you mentioned but i think collectively they they, they are very important um to each other the question from bruno it's sort of a three-part related question. Um, striatum is a target for research since it's also related with motor sequence. Could we think memory of a movement the same way we think about memory in general? And in your opinion, could we link hi hippocampus to movement? Thinking about movement as a goal-directed behavior and is there any motor memory, like remembering movements that you make to get somewhere? Yep, um, it's a good question. Um, Many people say, including my, um, my colleague at, at uh, Columbia, Danielle Wolpert, who studies movement, that, that it's all movement. That ultimately what an organism does is make movements. And um, it draws on all it can to know which movements to make. And I think to some extent, um, that's absolutely true. It's kind of the final output of what we do. And it, without it, we wouldn't survive without, act, without movement. And so we should inform our movements. In, from with everything we do, I, I, I mean, it's very much how I feel about decisions that ultimately we make decisions, but we make decisions usually by movement. Um, so I, I think it, it, I think it's, um, I think it's uh, relevant and useful to think of movement uh, in that way. Um, at the same time, you mentioned uh, learning motor sequences. Um, Learning motor sequences sometimes depends on the hippocampus and sometimes does not. There are some studies showing that initial learning of motor sequences depends on the hippocampus, but after they're well learned, they no longer depend on the hippocampus. And um, part of the thought is that maybe what the hippocampus at some point remembers is just sort of the trigger, and then um, other parts of the brain, like the stratum or the cerebellum, remember the full kind of uh, sequential order of the movements. Um, so I, I do think the hippocampus contributes in interesting ways, but probably. Um, you know, it's not, it's, not, it's not the deficit you see in patients with hippocampal damage. Okay, I'm going to take another one from, who wrote in. Alina asks, is the hippocampus involved in storing or just forming memories? Was there any progress related to how our memories stored? Proteins, question. Um, the original thought after HM was that the hippocampus was only important for creating memories and not for storing them. Um, and that the way uh, memories were stored as that they were slowly transferred out of the hippocampus into storage in cortical networks. The findings about imagination and this idea that we need the hippocampus to reconstruct memories anew, um, I think really sort of brought back the focus of the hippocampus as being important, not just for creating memories, but that it's important for retrieving them as well. Um, and that even if it's not essential for storing them necessarily, that there's still aspects of the kind of bringing back a memory from storage and experiencing it that is deeply related to hippocampal function. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's an area of change. I think there's, there's even still some disagreement about those statements, but I think the, um, the evidence is really on the side of um, the hippocampus being important both for creating and for retrieving memories. We're gonna take a live question from Rich Allen. Hi, Daphna. Hello. Hey for sharing your curiosity and your courage in asking deep questions with us. Um, my question was how you think pharmacology might be used to examine memory, maybe small molecules that impact spatial short-term memory, others that might bring back old emotional memories, and others that might imp impact flexibility of established patterns or narratives or forming new memories. Um, another great question. Um, uh, pharmacology is fundamental to everything the brain does when, you know, the, the, the the kind of basic thing the brain does is it uses electricity and chemistry to uh, transmit signals and communicate. Um, that chemistry is all pharmacology, um, so um, it's, it's fundamental. Um, there's some interesting studies specifically about how particular neurotransmitters 
play a role in shifting um, modes of the hippocampus that are related to the trade-off I talked about. There's work um, uh, by Mike Hasselmo uh, doing uh, elegant computational modeling based on some of the neurochemical modulation and then subsequent work on kind of behavioral side by uh, Catherine Duncan, who's uh, now at University of Toronto, former postdoc, uh, looking at some of the behavioral consequences, um, and particularly this idea that uh, acetylcholine, um, uh, the neurotransmitter, plays a role in basically shifting the hippocampus from a state that's better for encoding versus a state that's better for retrieval. And that um, uh, has uh, parallels with this idea of sort of the trade-off between sort of the accuracy and encoding versus the flexibility at, on the side of retrieving and reconstructing. So I think it's a, it's a hugely important question. The, the truth is we don't hear, um, we don't know as much as we uh, would like about neuromodulation pharmacology in humans because it's, uh, we just don't quite have the right tools yet. But again, any, any engineers out there, that's another really good direction is to figure out how to image um, particular neurochemical activity in humans non-invasively. That's, um, that's going to be really important. It's going, it's going to happen, but we don't have it yet. We have a question for, from Terame, who asks, what impact do you believe this collective trauma and chronic uncertainty due to COVID-19 will have on our brains? Hmm. Um, you know, when it just started, I was struck by, I was talking with my friend about the impact it had on our decision making. There was this sort of weird decision paralysis. I think many of us felt about what felt like really insignificant things. It felt like what we were doing, we're making decisions all the time. And so I actually wrote something about that um, I, I, as an opinion for a CNN at, at my friend's uh, persuasion. And uh, so, you know, I, I've been thinking about this a lot um, at, at, on every level. Um, because it's sort of a moment where, you know, spend all my days in meetings and working on projects with, you know, the folks in my lab. And at the same time, we're all kind of feel like we're subjects in our own experiments now about stress and uncertainty and decision making and memory uh, and curiosity. Um, I, I don't, I don't think I have, you know, a clear perspective on what, what it's doing. I think it's doing many, many things. Uh, I think it also varies vastly by individuals. I think it's not just um, the kind of uncertainty and stress that everyone's experiencing. On top of it, it's like these punctuating narratives, all like the, the world events, the national events. Uh, I, think, I, I think we're going to have a sense of um, many, many, many chapters uh, in, our, in our memory when we look back on this, because it's um, and I mentioned that the author Nicole Krause, you know, we were just talking about this earlier today, this idea that there's, um, you know, it's like one part of the story began and there's already in our, a new part of the story. It's like there's no, I think our, our minds don't have time to process and complete one part of the narrative before another begins. And I, I think that's going to have a big impact on how we, how confused I think we'll end up feeling about what led to what. Uh, and I think it'll really be for the historians to help us um, make sense of, of a lot of this. Uh, these are exactly, you know, when we work in the lab on things that impact memory, like in these experiments I'm describing, these are exactly the things that we look at, uncertainty and stress and um, events of significance. And so there, there's no question um, that it's sort of a very fascinating real world experiment. And I think we'll probably be thinking about this for many years to come. I'm not sure I can understand this one, but it says, uh, M. Edwards asks, when patients have closed head injuries, most would conclude injuries to areas such as prefrontal cortex et al. How often do you find the hippocampus is affected by these injuries? And to share with us your most recent Buridan's paradox? Yeah. Um, the um, injuries to the hippocampus are most common um, from uh, metabolic act activity issues, uh, anoxia and hypoxia, the neurons in the hippocampus, they're unique in many ways, which just adds kind of to the mystery of this brain region. But one of them is that they're, uh, they're metabolically sensitive. When there's a lack of oxygen, hippocampal neurons die uh, rapidly. Um, so that's the most, um, that's one of the most common causes of hippocampal uh, dysfunction and not so much uh, trauma. The hippocampus is sort of well sheltered deep, deep in the brain. Um, Britain's paradox was it what was the question to, to explain to share your most recent I believe the Whatever. findings about that um, I kind of glassed it went over pretty quickly because I realized I was running out of time but the um, 
the, the basic idea was the study that we're asking, the, the paradox refers to uh, basically indecision because two things are equally appealing. Um, and the way we've been looking at that is to sort of use um, decisions in, 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 in um, both healthy people and patients with memory loss and where we're showing the patients with memory loss um, have a harder time with those sorts of decisions and take more time in general um, for uh, decisions about value uh, than healthy people do. We'll take a live one from John's iPad. Sorry, it's actually John's girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, um, sometimes, you know, when you're friends with someone a long time or whatever, uh, they tell a story and then they tell the story again and then they tell the story again. And sometimes over time, you notice the story's getting more interesting or <laughs> is this all part of the, um, you know, making it, for lack of a better term, marketable? Uh, is, it, is your memory kind of including those parts, th those additions, like almost as a real memory because that made people react in a more positive way to your story? I, th I think that's it's a great example of exactly that kind of process, right? That um, that, that is, it, it, it all is related to, to this observation that our memories are really not this sort of static thing that was created and shoved in a drawer. It's that it's a constructive process that every time we retrieve a memory, we're reconstructing it. Um, and therefore, every time we retrieve a memory is an opportunity to re-encode it as well. Um, and so, you know, there's actually been work on this by um, Daniela Schiller and Marie Montfi and, and um, um, Joe Ledoux and Liz Phelps trying to take advantage of that, say, okay, well, then maybe we can help with traumatic memories because we can re-encode them in a safe context in a certain kind of time window. Um, but yeah, I, I, so I think that's exactly what that speaks to, right, and that, that people aren't doing it on purpose uh, and saying, oh, this time I'll tell it with this other fact. It's just that it's genuinely, um, alive and changing each time. Okay, we got a question here by, uh, from Joshua. Is there any correlation between sight impairment and the observed activation of the hippocampus when recalling memory details? I don't know if that's been looked at. I don't know. So, I mean, th th this whole idea that um, we need the memory for imagining some of the early anecdotal evidence have been, you know, it was available for a long time, but it really kind of the, the, the turning point in the field was probably about 10 years ago, which is not that long in scientific terms. So I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't know of any studies that have looked at that. It's an interesting question. I mean, many, many studies have looked in general at this idea of retrieving a memory, activating sensory regions, that when you retrieve a memory of a face, as I mentioned, you activate face regions and you, that in general, when you retrieve a memory, you are activating networks in the brain that were part of the encoding of that memory to begin with. Um, but I don't know if anyone's looked specifically at sort of this relationship between um, visual details um, and, and, and the hippocampus. Okay, I'll take a live one here from um, Pamela Clare, if Pamela is there. Hi, thank you. Thanks so much for this talk. It's been fascinating. And I have a question about recall. Like, I'm going to give an example. I used to live in Boston in the 70s. So when I, I can think about, I can recall a memory from Boston in my mind. And then when I look at a picture that has something of the same memory, I go, oh my gosh, that looks so old fashioned. But in my mind, I don't see it as old fashioned. So am I seeing the memory in my mind with the person I was when that memory occurred? Yeah, it's, a, it's such a great insight. It's such a great example of how our, it's almost like our minds are tricking us on one hand, but they're doing it in a way that makes sense, right? It's like your, your mind is updating things because it knows it should be updated. Um, uh, you know, I don't know how many pe people, how many of you, you know, still here and listening had, had this experience, but I have kids and they're a certain age and I have, there's such a part of my life now that I find myself in certain situations remembering events and I think to, like, we were in Vietnam, where were the kids? We didn't have kids, but it's like I've updated my Vietnam memory to include the kids and I have to go back and factually correct it. And so there's a way in which our memories, because they have this sort of dynamic updating property, so what if it's not accurate? The, you know, I think part, part of what's gotten us really interested in this idea is it's not supposed to be accurate. That's not the point. 
Um, the point is the updating itself because that's what matters in the end. Have efforts been made in the field to evaluate the validity of the findings across, across different cultures and backgrounds? That's from Gabrielle. Another great question. Um, uh, there's, there's a whole field of cultural psychology um, it, which addresses this question. There's been a lot more work um, kind of looking at cross-cultural comparisons for various things related to uh, psychology, behavior, cognition, much less for neuroscience. Um, although it might just be a matter of time, I think it's sort of the practical constraints uh, in doing that kind of work and, and combined with brain imaging and in general. Um, and um, so I, you know, the work is out there. I, I, I don't, I'm not a big expert on it. It's pretty far from my area, but I, I think it's an interesting idea, especially because you know, I think one of the if you really kind of extrapolate back from a lot of what I talked about today is this idea that who, who we are is this interplay between our experiences and how they get encoded and how they get used. And um, it's not just that there's the biology and there's the experience, it's that it's all very, very interrelated and constantly uh, updating. And I, I think culture is very interesting um, to think of in that regard because it's exactly in a sense, it's kind of what culture is, right? It's sort of like a way in which we iteratively sh are shaped by our experiences and shape our environment in one, you know, in, in, in kind of a particular trajectory. So um, I, don't, I don't have much more to add. I, I, I think it's a really fascinating question. Well, we have one more hand raiser and we have a ton of written ones. So why don't we take the hand raiser and I'm gonna consolidate these other ones and we're gonna figure out something to do here. So we have Madeline G if you're there. Um, so I've been wondering, I'm a second year student at the University of Chicago and I'm studying neuroscience. And I think it was so interesting how you started out this whole talk talking about Proust and the Madelines and how identity and memory are tied. And I actually had written a paper starting out that way for my final paper for my neuroscience class. So I was thinking, um, could you talk a little bit more about this connection between identity and memory and also how that might be shown with things like dissociative identity disorder? Because in that case, people may have different memory systems and different identities and different personalities. And um, perhaps it's something about the neural circuitry and the functioning rather than the actual structure. Um, for, first of all, I just want to tell you that um, Akram Bakur, the former postdoc who's been doing these, you know, really beautiful studies on simple decisions, valuation, and there's sort of a lot of computational depth to that work that I didn't go into at all, but he's starting a position at the University of Chicago next month, so you should find him. Um, and um, I think that, you know, this question of, of identity and memory feels to me um, like one of those aspects of memory that led many of us into memory research and yet um, at the neurobiological level, we just don't have the tools to really address it yet. Um, I think, I mean, just you know, bird, bird's eye view, it's, we've made so much progress in the 20 years I've been in the field on one hand, it's sort of just unbelievable how much we've learned and yet it's really interesting how little we still know when it comes to these sort of high level questions about um, who we are and uh, what memory does for us. And um, so I, 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 I think we're not there yet. I think it's still one of those questions that's um, better addressed in other fields and that we don't really have a good handle, I think, uh, neuroscientifically on even how to, how to begin questions of, of identity and memory in terms of neural circuits. Um, there's a lot of work on autobiographical memory, but I think a lot, you know, a lot of the work on memory, I think one of the strengths of the field of, of memory is that a lot of the work is connected across animal and human work and basic mechanisms. Um, but by the same token, a lot of it has, you know, what does it mean to study identity in an animal is something I think we don't know how to do yet. And so it's been harder to, to get at those kinds of questions. Okay, well, I think we have put you through many questions and there are many more, I'm saving them. Please we'll do, yeah. fantastic do questions. And so Definitely, fantastic questions. talk and what a great, great amount of questions and um, answers, of course. Daphna Shohemi, thank you so much for speaking with us. Margaret's gonna join us somewhere here. Thank, oh, and thank you both so much and thank you everyone um, for, for this turnout and, and for being so generous and thoughtful with your questions and brave and really a lot, a lot of questions to think about. I really, really appreciate it.
I definitely thank you for taking so many of the questions <laughs> and, and we wish we could go literally all night long because there were yes. a, a lot more, but this was fantastic. We appreciate your coming uh, to talk Secret Science Club and thank you again to the Dana Foundation for um, you know, presenting, co-presenting and sponsoring this. It was really wonderful. Yes.